Today's date is April 8, 2000. The following is a panel discussion with members of the Mosquito Beaters, recorded at the Tebow Field Library, 435 Brevard Avenue in Cocoa. The panel members are Bob Cowart, Marion Patterson Jackson, and George Leland Harrell. The moderator is Nick Wynn. The cameraman is Laritz Karoff. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a pleasure once again to have you here at the Tebow Field Library for our Saturday afternoon lecture series. Today is not a lecture, it's a uh, discussion by some of the, quote, old timers about growing up here in uh, central Lombard <laughs> County. The format for today is rather uh, unstructured. Uh, the interviews and the responses of the people here are being uh, filmed uh, by the uh, Brevard County Historical Commission. Uh, we have back here uh, Mr. Laritz Karoff, uh, who is doing this in a professional manner. Uh, some of you may know his mother, Georgiana uh, Karoff, who uh, has written uh, Tales of Old Brevard and uh, other, other stuff. So uh, yeah, he's going to be doing it for us. What I've prepared is a, a, a number of uh, just questions to get started. Uh, these are uh, uh, general questions and I would encourage you as they respond to the questions to jump in, ask questions, add to it. We'd like to have it a very freewheeling kind of environment uh, so that uh, uh, we can uh, cover as much ground as possible and if you have recollections you want to share then I encourage you to do so. Uh, first thing we're going to do is to ask our panelists to give their name and a little background, and we'll start over here, Bobby, with you. Well, I'm Bob Cowart, and uh, I grew up in Coco, and I am 75 years old. I came here when I was four months old. I don't remember it, <laughs> but uh, the older I get, the, the, the my, my forgetter works much better. So, any question you ask, I will try my best to answer. Thank you. I'm Marion Patterson Jackson. I was born here. My father was born here. My grandmother came when she was 17 in the early 1880s. I don't know just when, but she came here with her father. He was supposed to die then, and I think he lived until 1911. So <laughs> it's a good place to live. <laughs> and uh, I married uh, here, and I raised my children here, and I guess I'll die here. But it's a good place. It's a good place to be from. It's a good place to live in. I like it. Speedy do not tell you to eat. 78. <laughs> Only Larry would ask that question. I doesn't care. I'm proud of it. I'm George Leland Harrell. I carry a nickname of Speedy. In the Army, I was called Coco short time I was there. So I answered to most anything if you're calling for a meal if some things they call me I take off running in the other direction so I get along very well with that uh, I was born down south I was born in Rockledge and I migrated up north because they told me everything was much better up north so I live in Coco now so we'll try to feel whatever questions you come up and if not we'll tell you something else <laughs> Uh, thank you. The, uh, most of you know this already, but uh, these are all uh, part of a group called the Mosquito Beaters. Uh, and Mosquito Beaters are a group of people who on the second March of every year have a uh, community reunion. And uh, uh, several thousand people come, people from as far away, I think, as New Zealand and Korea <laughs> and Texas. Of course, people from Texas are all Speedy's relatives. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They, they drive that way just for the Friday night free meal. Uh, so, uh, I have a, my first question here is, and, and we'll start with Bobby, uh, what was your earliest memory of Coco? You said you didn't remember when you came here four, four months old. No, I, I don't know. I, I can remember things back to when I was about four years old. And uh, I was thinking the other day, one of the first things I remember was being down in the village with my daddy and there was a bunch of people standing on the corner and I couldn't understand what they were saying 
And uh, my dad, I said, Dad, what are they saying? He said, well, that's a bunch of Italians. They live around Merritt Island. <laughs> well, that is, the, uh, of course, the Graffalos, the Polizzi Policiccios, and, and uh, Fenaris, and whatever. I found out later. But I didn't even know what an Italian was. I never heard the word before. Mary? My first remembrance, and I, uh, there's a picture of a sidecar over there, a motorcycle sidecar. My daddy had a, an Indian motorcycle with a sidecar. Now, he used the motorcycle to go down the river road from his grandfather's grocery store and take orders for groceries. And then he would come back, and they'd fill the grocery order, and he would take them back in the truck. But my first remembrance is... I don't know how old I was, it, it had to be over two because my brother was a baby and I was on a stool in the sidecar riding with mom and daddy. She said my first word was moon. <laughs> and uh, that's the first thing I remember. Then there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a gap. Speedy? I don't really know what would have been my first memory of Coco. One of the early memories that stands out very vividly, I was a little fella, I don't know how big, but my dad was paying off a crew of men on the street out back. Up, there was a big oak tree up back a, a Reed store, and that's where he'd pay off the crew of men. And he asked me to take a $10 bill and go down to Barnett Bank and get him 10 $1 bills. Well, I'd never been in a bank before in my life. I didn't know anything about it, but I went in there. Mr. Joyner was the teller there, and he even used the wrong hand. He was left-handed, and he counted me out 10 $1 bills so fast I didn't know what happened. And to this day, that seems to me as one of the biggest pile of money I ever saw. <laughs> Up until then, I think I'd had a quarter. <laughs> when was that, anyway, one year? That would have been probably... 34. Ten dollars and 34 was a big yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the next question, uh, next two questions are sort of connected with that. I had, uh, uh, and, and you probably ought to think a little bit about this, what was your best memory uh, growing up? And uh, of course, I know Bobby's going to say I haven't grown up yet. Uh, <laughs> and your worst memory uh, of living here today? Best and worst. Nick, why do you pick on me starting this stuff every time? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I guess that you have a ten that, uh, at least I have a tendency to remember the good things. It's hard to remember bad things. To me, I I just have enjoyed living in Coco. I can't think of any bad things. I guess the first the worst thing was when my my. Uh, father died was probably the first bad thing I can remember. But uh, how old were you? Uh, I, I was uh, I was uh, uh, about fourteen or fifth. I guess I was fifteen at the time. Yeah. But it hit me pretty hard. Yeah. yeah. But uh, outside of that, I, I've enjoyed living in Coco. I I can remember the good times better than the, old, the bad. I guess. That's good. And I, I, I think maybe most people that way. I don't know. <laughs> I think the freedom that we had growing up in town, uh, it was small, and town seemed to encompass, oh, probably about two, three blocks that way and two, three blocks this way, and so nobody had cars. Uh, you walked, you could walk, even as a young child. Uh, I lived uh, two blocks, practically. I lived, grew up on Peachtree Street. My grandmother lived on Willard Street, which are adjacent uh, which is adjacent to Peachtree Street, and then you get to King Street, and you're in town, the middle of town. And I could walk, uh, as young, we, we didn't have any age restrictions that I remember being old enough to do it. We could do it, we could be downtown. It's like the, our president's wife says, it takes a village to raise children. Well, that's the way it was around here. The village raised us. <laughs> we did nothing wrong that we didn't want reported. <laughs> because it would be. Now, did y'all refer to it as a village or just No, it was downtown. Let's go downtown. <laughs> yeah. You know. Downtown. And uh, <laughs> the worst thing, maybe the worst thing might have been not getting caught sneaking into the movie because they knew we snuck in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it didn't cost but a dime, but we didn't have a dime. And uh, we'd sneak into the movies, you know, and I know Mr. Cogswell saw us, 
But uh, we still did it with trepidation in our hearts because we were afraid we would get caught. There really wasn't uh, much bad going on in that time. What kind or of, any time. What, what kind of movies do you remember from that period? Well, uh, I barely remember The Silence. Uh, we didn't go to them too much. I do halfway remember the piano or organ that was up front that played when the silence were on. And I suppose I, it had to be after I learned to read before I was ever there. And I don't believe I ever went to any silence alone that I recall. Uh, the movies, of course, uh, whatever was on. What? <laughs> <laughs> but I do miss, I miss the travelogues, I miss the cartoons. I miss the things that they had before the feature film. No like your cereals. Well, yeah, the cereals, the cartoons, yeah, they said cereals and car, you know, I, I miss those three or four things they had before the, the movies. And uh, of course, you could just stay right on in. It was continuous. They didn't turn the lights on and turn you out like they do now. You could just stay and see it as many times as you needed to be. Be gone as long as you had to be gone, you know. I grew up, I grew up in South Georgia, and I can remember my family coming in on Saturdays and coming in early and stay at the 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and we would park down in the movie theater and stay there literally all day watching two or three. I assume you did that too. Or maybe well, no, because I lived, I was I was in what, two two blocks of town, you know, yeah. so I didn't have to, have to stay any longer than I really just wanted to. And the fun part at night though was if you could be downtown at night was to sit on the benches with the people that came to town from over on the bridge or, you know, and had a long ways to come and then just sit on the benches with them and, and chat with those folks. That was what was, that was a lot of fun. Speedy. Have you got a problem back there, Bob? With um, could I tap on the table? It's, it's picture of the uh, recorder. I'll quit that. <laughs> No. Oh, did it? Our Methodist Church is Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it came. Your church. And that's where the organ went up. That organ went up there and stayed there until we moved up on first And I don't want to have to attend, but it served a long time. And was it a pump organ? Organ or? When did it go up there? When did you say they got it? Uh, we moved. Well, I don't know when. You don't know when they got it. Yeah. There's a piece in the paper, a microfilm, uh, library down, a lot of microfilm stuff, a doctor is told, of course, a tribune and so forth. I'm doing research, that's when I found an article about that. That's interesting. Going up there. I think my grandmother used to play, my grandmother Patterson used to play the piano for the Methodist Church many years ago. Now, I don't know when the switch happened, but there was a falling out with the Methodist Church, and she ended up at the Episcopal Church. I don't know what the falling out was, or just when it happened. <laughs> One more thing. When people have a question, would you repeat for them what they're asking? Yeah. 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 Yeah
And then you, you saw a lot of friends, I guess during the summertime when school was out, you didn't see them living down there. It was good to come into town and, and see some of your friends. And then crossing the bridge way back, we had a president named Hoover at some point, and people really banked up on the old bridge to fish. But they tell me they were really fishing for food. Uh, my dad had a cast net, and he'd usually just go down the river bank and catch mullet for us. But we'd cross that bridge sometimes, and there'd be people on there so thick uh, fishing. And as I remember as a kid, there was always one winder that was broken out of the old car, so they'd tell us to move away from that open winder. Didn't want to get us hooked with a fish hook as we crossed <laughs> that wooden bridge. Speedy was the was uh, Mr. Abney's. I mean, um, Mr. Abney's store was it on the river, on in the river at that it time? It was over the river. It was like it was when I remember it. The front end of it was on the shore at the end of City Point uh, right. Road, mm -hmm. and the back of it was out over the just the one building. Uh, that, the one building. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. any, whether he had another building or not. Though there was There's only there. one building that I knew anything about, and at the back door it had a big. Uh, like a garage door that opened out onto the river. I well, it probably was serviced by the boats. Serviced uh, by earlier, the boats at that on, time. Yeah. And they would open that door up, and some people would, would feed the catfish and stuff out that, that window. Was the post office in the back? The post office was in the back. Sometimes they'd have 12 or 15 letters in there at the time. <laughs> 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 you were talking about the bridge, and my grandfather Franklin was bridge tender, day bridge tender on the old wooden right. bridge yeah. for a lot of years. Uh, I don't remember from when to when, because as a kid I didn't pay any attention to what was. I just was. I existed. And, you know, went with the flow. But my, they used to tell the old story about my grandfather who came from Illinois and didn't know from grits. He knew cornmeal mush and stuff like that, but he didn't know grits. And so they tell about Mr. T Mr. Franklin built fixing some grits one time, and he started off apparently with a small pot. They had a small <coughs> toll booth there on the south side of the bridge in the center, and it was about as big as this table is twice. It just there just was not much room, maybe a little deeper. But he had a little stove in there and on a, a little toilet over on this end, which allowed itself to go down to the water almost, and uh, the pipe. And anyway, he was fixing his grits, and he started out in a pot. Well, I think he went one-on-one. -on -one. And then he got another pot because it got... <laughs> and they said that Mr. Franklin, my grandfather, had pots all over the place there <laughs> with, with his first grits. <laughs> Took him several pots yeah. to get grits. <laughs> and we kids, well, we thought one of the greatest things in the world would be to do to go into the toilet and flush it. Because when we flushed it, water came down and just tore all over the place in the river and the catfish just came and <laughs> tore all over the place. <laughs> we thought that was funny. Frank, did you have a question? Yeah, did that old building up there turn out to be Hubs in later on? No. <clears throat> No, two different buildings. Hubs Inn was further north. The City Point Post Office and store building was never Hubs Inn. Hubs Inn was farther north, mm -hmm. yes. You can still see the pilings where, well, both buildings were. Because uh, I was just down there this road. The river road is home. <clears throat> you, I don't care where you've been or how long you've been gone. When you ride the river road from point to point, you're home. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And if you haven't ridden it in a long time, you ride it should, again to see should. who's building houses where, you know. That's true. One, uh, of the, uh, one of the things here, you mentioned grits and you talked about shopping and Bob uh, Gross back there uh, suggested that perhaps uh, uh, you might want to uh, just talk uh, in general terms about uh, the kinds of foodstuffs that you had during the week. And he said, I'm sure it wasn't all fried chicken every day. Uh, <laughs> Every Sunday. <laughs> uh, every, every Sunday. Uh, was there a lot of vegetable growing around here, or, or was it uh, sort of necessary to, to, to bring stuff in? Or, well, I was a city girl. We uh, lived on Peachtree Street. You didn't have you a, know, I was a city girl. You didn't have a backyard so garden? We had a backyard, but no garden. Uh, 
Uh-huh. We had, when, when I was young, we had a good well, and this is, I guess, before city water, because we sold five-gallon jugs, uh, my folks did, of water. Mm. And uh, I can remember uh, those five-gallon jugs, and Mama delivered them off, and her doctor gave her the devil for lifting those yeah. heavy <laughs> jugs. But we had a, apparently had a good well, and it must have been before mm-hmm. uh, city water. We had grapefruit trees in the yard, and I do remember one time Daddy trying to raise some <laughs> turkeys on, on wire, and they didn't put a roof on them. They, turkeys drowned themselves when it rained one day because turkeys, I'm told, will lift their heads up and <laughs> drink the water and drown themselves. Are you sure those jugs were water jugs, Marion? <laughs> she might have had a really yeah. You might have had a better deal going than you realize. Well, the ones on the back porch were the water jugs that had were grapefruit wine making in them. I, I, I never did like wine in those days, and I couldn't understand it, but they, they were always out there in the back making wine, making wine. And then another story, my grandfather was going to make some kummel, uh, and I understand that's made. What did what's they make it with? I've forgotten now. Anyway, you're supposed to leave it alone. <laughs> Grand Grand got into it every day. And Man, it you're up talking and about the grapefruit growing in the yard. They were probably making grapefruit wine. Didn't they? Well, they, they were making. That's what was on the back porch, all covered up. You know, the grapefruit wine. But. Uh, well, my dad came from South Georgia, and he always considered himself a farmer. No matter what type of work he was doing, he said he was a farmer. So we had a garden, and we had plenty of vegetables, and we had chickens that ran loose in the yard. Before they were free range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before it was important. Uh, the, when we lived in Rockledge as a small kid, I don't personally remember too much about it, but uh, they heard him talk about it. The mule lot, they worked the, mule, the groves with mules and there was a mule lot that was about halfway between Rockledge Drive and what's now US-1. And there was plenty of chickens at the mule lot that they ate with the mules. And there was a black man that lived there on the grove. And the hawks would get in the chickens. And Daddy told him, he said, "Uh, Frank, I want to let you take a shotgun. And said, every time you kill a hawk, you can get a chicken to eat so that we stop the hawks from getting the chickens. He said, that'll be fine, Mr. Harold, but said, the day I kill the hawk, I'll just eat him and I'll give the chicken another day. So <laughs> I'm sure he was eating chickens when he wanted them. They always, uh, was plenty of chickens around. Well, would you, do you see any, do, do any of you see any real differences, say, uh, and I'm not talking when you're eating out and, and when everybody's looking at you, but. Do you see any real differences in at-home eating? Uh, it's, it's sort of like when I go out with my wife, you know, I'm always worried about broiled stuff, but I'm not worried about it. She's worried about it, and I have to eat it. Uh, but uh, uh, has anything changed? Uh, yeah, have you seen a large dietary change uh, taking place? Well, you did, of course, you didn't have uh, you didn't have frozen foods then. Yeah. Uh, in fact. Uh, most people just had an ice box. We went yeah. to the ice house and and uh, bought a block of ice and put it in the top of the refrigerator and and they used, had a drip pan at the bottom to catch the water that melted off the ice or else we had a hole in the floor with a, mm-hmm. a, a piece of hose that went through if the, if the house was off built off the ground, which a lot of them were. Of course, you didn't have those. And uh, you... Uh, People went, uh, they, they, your know, fresh meats, they, didn't, they wouldn't keep too long, especially people that only went to town once a week, like Speedy was talking right. about. So they'd eat country ham or, or uh, country cured bacon or whatever. And of course, they had their chickens. Right. And uh, did they, uh, they, did, they did quite well. Did, did you eat a lot more fish back then than you do today? The question is, did you eat a lot more fish than you did today? Well, (laughs) I grew up during the Depression, like I guess all of us did, and I ate so many fish that I kind of got tired of it. (laughs) I ate so much chicken, I was kind of tired of it, too. 
uh, a piece of steak was was, was good, good to come by. I'll put it that way. Now, now, did your families, did your mothers uh, uh, spend a lot of time canning? I can remember my mother canning. No, no she didn't do a lot of canning. No. Uh, with the, the old ball thing. jars and uh, boiling them and sealing them. And, uh, when the blackberry season was in, you pick like crazy and peach, you pickle peaches. And, and my wife grew up in Detroit. This is all foreign food to her. Uh, and uh, uh, but a lot of uh, black eyed, dried, dried black eyed peas and fat back and uh, uh, rice and Irish potatoes. Uh, <laughs> Josie's getting hungry over there. <laughs> lard back in those days, too. Didn't have vegetable oil. Now, you used to buy lard, if I remember uh, my family buying it in the big tin can, uh, was 25 pounds. Uh, that was uh, before we knew about vitamins and vegetable oil. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I don't know how Mama did it, but I can remember, she, and I can't imagine what size pot roast she used to buy. But she'd buy a piece of chuck, and we'd have pot roast, and it seems to me we had it a minimum of three days, different, fixed different. But there were four of us in the family. Now, I can't imagine what size she bought. Now, let me to have, <coughs> and when, and when, and when I, as I recall, and, and I guess I did the same thing, I cooked for five people. I didn't cook with a table full of seconds and help, second helpings. I cooked for five and that was it. When you were done, you were done, you washed the dishes. You didn't put the leftovers away because there weren't any. I didn't cook that way. I didn't raise the... Well, I, I can remember growing up, I, sort of like Speedy in the country, where you had an old pie safe. And it would seem to me that people would cook and, and they would store it in the pie safe. And today, when you get through, everything goes in the refrigerator. Uh, but, you know, you would eat out of the pie safe for a couple, three days without... I didn't see that until I went to the Nick, explain, a, my... explain a, a, a pie safe to, to someone who might not know what it was. Uh, a pie safe, the one we had was a wooden, uh, looks like a china cabinet, uh, usually fairly crudely made, but it had screen... Uh, uh, covering uh, ventilation holes and the, the, the air would circulate through there and uh, uh, depending on uh, whether you made it or not. And the flies, it, uh, the flies couldn't get to it. The flies the couldn't get to it. <laughs> like uh, an iceless icebox yeah. till supper time. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can remember on Sunday afternoons when you had chicken for Sunday dinner and you would, my mother would leave that sitting on top of the stove and you would go back through there about 50 mm -hmm. times uh, and grabbing this and grabbing that or a piece of ham and and I guess it's uh, one of the comforts of going home to Georgia is my mother still does that, and uh, uh, we, we can all leave that. Uh, 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 but I uh, uh, grew up in a, in a farming area, and, and canning was a very big thing there where people canned all, and the home demonstration agent used to do it. Well, you mentioned the icebox. Once again, in the country, we had the ice man that used to come around. And that was a big event you were talking about because you could chase the ice man down the street and when they used the ice pick you could get those little slivers of ice and uh, he'd set off the uh, ice block and you would wrap it in a uh, croaker sack and uh, if you got uh, extra and it wouldn't fit in the ice box and then you put it in the number two wash tub and put sawdust around it to keep it uh, well, yeah. th th you're right. You had your ice man. The reason I mentioned that, when I lived in Cocoa, I had a little red wagon, uh, and, the, and the ice house was right over here, uh, a, bl a block from here. And I'd take my little red wagon and go up there and get the ice and bring it back in the wagon because it was cheaper at the dock at the ice uh, house than if they delivered it in the truck. Now, you uh, saved a nickel, that's uh, what you did. <laughs> Did y'all ever make homemade ice cream with that ice where you would, and you would have to sit on top of that churn and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> put salt, salt. I was talking it. to somebody the other day and they were looking at, uh, actually uh, I looked several years ago, but one of those little hand churns and used to buy them for like five or six dollars and now they're about a hundred and fifty dollars just to get uh, one that's not electric. Yes ma'am. I heard anyone mention here about how they used to bury uh, bats in the ground where they kept their, their milk and have you ever heard of that? Uh, did they do it around here as a road seller? Not, not here so much. That was more or less where you had a spring house or a root cellar or something. Well, those fine things that we didn't have here. We had uh, a potato bank. We grew uh, sweet potatoes, and when you'd gather those, you'd 
pile of, put a pile of pine straw on the ground and then pile the sweet potatoes up on it and put some boards over it and put some dirt on it and then they wouldn't freeze in there and they it was more or less the right moisture content and they called it a potato bank a sweet potato bank and that there was more cold sweet potatoes baked sweet potatoes in that pie safe than there was pies in it the pie didn't last but that cold sweet potato was usually there and we had a milk cow and we would put my mother had she called them milk milk pans they were big pans and you put the milk in those pans and put them in that safe and the cream would rise to the top and you could skim that off to to make the butter and that uh few years back I was up in North Florida and uh, people had a churn in their house an old churn and I said well I guess I'll never get any more fresh butter and the man said well you can he said I was at uh, one of the agricultural inspection stations and there was a load of cream a semi truck load of cream that was going through that station and the man said told him, said, that load of cream is coming and we've got to take a sample. And he said, I'll take a big sample and you can, <laughs> you can make you some butter. So I, I thought that was a good deal. And he said, just use your hand mixer and go very slow with it. So I got back, I rounded up a, the mixer and I went and bought some cream at the store and I got my granddaughter. So we made butter. She watched, very skeptical of what I was doing. And when it makes butter, there'll be milk mixed in with this butter. That's and you, way, isn't that what the Yeah, is? you have to wash it with water to get rid of that stuff. And then you put your butter, uh, I'll put it in the refrigerator after that. And she agreed that it was butter, but she wasn't enthusiastic about it. <laughs> But after it got cold in the refrigerator and was hard, she said, well, it did make butter, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sort of like the old barter. Remember the old barter where you had to do the yellow, break the yellow? Nuka. Nuka was yeah. the name of it. Oh, that was the nastiest <laughs> stuff to mix. <laughs> there was what? There was a way to cheat on that margarine, put your coloring in it, turn, put it in the mixing bowl, and beat it with a and then throw a soft stick of butter in and it tasted exactly like fresh cow butter. <laughs> Frank? Yes, uh, on this milk, I'm making buttermilk and, and butter. And I, my boy had to do the churn, you know, like this. I learned all about making buttermilk and butter, skimming the butter, butter on top. I knew you're supposed to save the cream off of this wonderful Guernsey and Jersey milk, you know, the richest cream and the richest milk that cows give Guernsey and Jersey, something like that. And Holstein. Uh, but Dad uh, and Mom always turned like that. But here in college, we got ninety dollars a month on the GI Bill. I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, my wife Polly, the first wife uh, from Canton, we're both from Canton, North Carolina, and uh, she knew about making butter too. So we used uh, we saved the cream off of our wonderful cold milk there in Fort Wayne, and uh, and we let that cream sour just to right up the mouth. We just smell it and know when to turn it. And so you take it in a quart jar or a half a gallon jar. Nice and jar. Do this for just about 15 minutes and after you're turning. And here comes this butter up to the top. Beautiful yellow butter. And we just skim that off and wash it like you're talking about. You wash it under the tap and put that in a little, little uh, serving dish. And that was our butter. And wonderful butter milk. Yeah. You can throw anything away. Sure. That's a latter day story. <laughs> well, my daddy, we didn't, we kids didn't get any of the cream that was on the milk that came with the milkman, which was in the, the bottles, you know, this tall with the cream at the top. Daddy, first off, Daddy had one of those little things you dip down in it and got the cream and he put that in his coffee. And if he didn't do that, then he would take the milk and Mama would pour it out in a soup plate and let it sit on the counter and clab it. <laughs> and then he'd put sugar on it and eat it <laughs> with saltines. And I don't know, I never did you it. You put it on rice? We used to do that with rice. I never messed with sour milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a it brand It took in me there. 40 years to drink Mary butter I, milk. Mary and I never learned to, to like clabber either. Oh, no, I, I never, never, I never I tasted it. Like, but it, it, a, a, lot, a lot of people did. Clabber girl? 
That's yeah, a bacon yeah. powder. Bacon powder. Yeah. Bacon powder. Yeah. Bacon powder. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, you had a question. Why did your parents or your grandparents come here, and what did they do when they first took for employment? How did they earn their living? My grandfather Moore, great grandfather Moore, who was my grandmother Patterson's, how did my grandparents come? My grandmother Patterson who was Carolyn Adela Moore, came with her father in the early 1880s from Babylon, Long Island. They, he was, in my understanding, not well, and he came down uh, presumably to die. I've later learned that he had a sister living here, uh, Mrs. Hover, and her husband Leonard, and they were apparently already in the area, and that's why they came here. Now, Nanny was only 17 when she came, uh, just a young girl. The, uh, her sister uh, was a year or two older, and she stayed in the north with her mother. I think they had a rooming house up there. I'm not real sure. I didn't listen when I was a child to the stories my grandparents used to tell me, and I'm just sick about that. The last time I tried to get my grandmother's stories was with, I would take it down in shorthand and she says, I'm too tired. But anyway, they came then and lived, I've got some of the papers that my grandmother had saved. They lived up on, the bought a house I think on the river road and they moved it around to Carmalt Street and uh, it was right next to the Carmalt Apartments, a little bitty old narrow two-story house. and. Uh, then my grandfather Patterson, uh, whom she married, came in the uh, 80s. I'm not just sure when he came, and I ran into some, uh, going through stuff, I ran into some letters, notes that he had brought with him from Scotland to Canada, and I just realized it, and this is, you know, they late the dollar short, that's me. But the letters were written by an aunt of his. His mother had been a French woman, and her sister apparently had written these uh, letters of introduction to him, for him, to some people in Canada and some people in Michigan. So I, I probably got relatives I never even thought about. But uh, anyway, why he came on down here, I'm not just sure. But we had at that time a sort of a Scottish colony up north on Merritt Island. Uh, the Whaleys and... Uh, the Everos or... Well, I think they, they had home, they were homesteading people and had groves up there, and Gramp was going to homestead. Uh, he was a little man. I dare say he was probably not an inch or two taller than I and probably didn't weigh much more than I did. And the joke in the family was the hoe handle didn't fit his hands. <laughs> and he was not trained to be a farmer. So he uh, went to work at Sanders' store as a clerk. And uh, Nanny's story on how she got him was that they were going, uh, maybe had gone to this party separately, probably did, uh, but uh, they were going home and uh, I guess he was going to escort her home and she tripped and had to hold on to him the rest of the way home. <laughs> she never did say she didn't trip, but she always said she tripped and had to hold on to him. And... Uh, Anybody that knew my grandmother knew that she was mouthier than I was, and <laughs> uh, she did, after they got married, she did all of the, the driving. He never learned to drive. She did, and uh, I don't know just when they bought the store building, the Patterson store building that's now a park by uh, Black Tulip, and... Uh, I, I just, you know, there's so much that you don't remember because you just don't pay attention when you're kids. Uh, my father was an only child, and my, my mother and her father, parent and mother, came in 1920 from Illinois. Uh, boom time, I think. He, uh, I think he had bought some property out where the college is now, 40 acres. And so he came and he bought the house that was next door to the old Knox Hotel. And now that I re recall, the Knox Hotel was owned by a man from Galesburg. There you go. You know, I guess it's all in there, just getting it out. And uh, 
it was just a two-story house, and he made a rooming house out of it. He added to it, and where the house had gone up like this, he made it come out like this, upstairs. And all this was bedrooms. And talk about the uh, one bath. Well, that was it, one bath in those days, and he had small rooms. And people came to town, and uh, they had that business, and then he got... a what was, I guess, a touring car at the time, and I thought it was real neat because it had little fold-down jump seats in the back. <coughs> and he would go out to the train station and bring passengers in uh, to where they wanted to go. And if, I guess if they didn't know where they wanted to go, they brought them to his house, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, he would let me go, and I'd get to ride on the jump seats. But she never forgave him for putting them in a rooming house to, <laughs> to take Barlow care of. Barlow was not the name of the man. Mr. Barlow, that's right. Ames Barlow. Ten to eight years, he lived on the back side there. Yeah, he lived right, right behind there. And Mabel Mead was the lady that came down from Galesburg with him and was his housekeeper. <laughs> oh, what you remember. Bobby, you Ms. said you Mead. came here when you yeah, were... Yeah, Mabel Mead. Miss Mead. Uh, Bobby, you said you came here when you were four months old. Uh, right. Why did your folks come down? Well, I, I, they farmed. Oh. And the way I understand it, they... The, uh, the farming was down, it was a depressed area, and uh, that uh, my father had made one of the best crops they ever made, but couldn't sell it. Mm -hmm. But the boom had started in Florida, and he would not only could farm, most farmers could build a barn and do this and that, so he came down here and went to work as a carpenter in Cocoa and Rockledge, and that's how they got here. Now, uh, did he come by himself first to scout it out, or did he just back there? He came and got a, got a job and then brought them down, right. I think. But as far as their roots, the best I can figure out, they came out, they out of the debtors, both sides of the family, the carts and the thick pens. They came out of the debtors, debtors prisons in England with Oglethorpe to Georgia. Georgia. And then eventually down here. That's a, that's a very common story. Uh, Deborah tells the story about looking for family roots uh, in Georgia, my family's roots, and somebody says, try the debtor prison records. <laughs> and she said, there are about 50 of them in there. Uh, I'll get your question, but let me uh, ask Speedy how his family got down there. Just the same way people that come today. They was <laughs> seeking their fortune. <laughs> they, uh, I guess the bow weevil had been part of the cotton problem up there. Again, in South Georgia, they was farming and they was work. Uh, my grandfather was already down here. He was on a grove over on North Merritt Island and had an uncle up in Titusville. So parents came for that. There was a fine gentleman that lived here in Cocos, Goober Yancey. I know a lot of you remember him. <laughs> He was not an educated man, but he certainly was not a dumb man. And Goober said that the reason there were so many people from South Georgia down here in Florida was that they would get big enough that they would finally buy them a pair of shoes and that they'd back up so they could look at their tracks until they'd back off into Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but the very same reason people come today, looking for a job, they if they'd had a big farm that they owned and the store in the bank and doing well up there, they'd have still been in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Those are called brogans, by the way. Yeah, so right. Brogans, if you, if you got any, yes, ma'am, you had a question. I, I remember reading this. I'm a newcomer, 65, but I've been reading up on the history of the area, and it's interesting. But this one settler came down I seem to read, I don't remember my source, but this one settler came down here out of Georgia, a Civil War veteran. He came down here looking for a new frontier for farming, good fertile land, because Sherman's march to the sea, he tore all the land up there, making it unfit for farming. Now, is that correct? Did well, uh, Mr. Sherman didn't hurt the land, but he sure hurt the people on the land. Uh, uh, I, I, the, the problem we had was one that, that Speedy made reference to there. Uh, in the old uh, <clears throat> cotton and tobacco areas uh, in Georgia, Alabama, most of the southern states, uh, it was a question of farming marginal land in many cases, and the end result was that you had erosion taking place pretty much about the same time as you had the uh, Dust Bowl out in Oklahoma. And uh, much of the topsoil, which was very thin to begin with, just simply washed away, and it was land that should not have been farmed extensively in the first place. And a lot of people uh, 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 simply uh, experienced uh, erosion, 
uh, and uh, uh, fallen markets, and they were looking for a, a new experience. Um, uh, you might remember this, uh, but the erosion problem was so great in the South that one of the things they did during the uh, New Deal was to introduce, reintroduce kudzu back in. Uh, and kudzu had first been introduced in the 1890s in the United States out of the Far East. And how many people in here know what kudzu is? Kudzu is that ubiquitous vine that grows all over everything, uh, has these little tendrils that bite into the soil. And it was one of those great New Deal problems, uh, or uh, great New Deal solutions. Uh, in, the, in the Far East, kudzu is considered somewhat of a delicacy, and people put it in a frying pan just like you, uh, uh, you cook mustard greens and a little, little oil, and you wilt it down. And it's considered to be very uh, uh, filling and very tasty. And it's also uh, full of nutrition. And, uh, nutrition. and so uh, during the New Deal, they introduced kudzu to do several things. One was to reclaim the eroded soil by breaking it down and creating new topsoil. And you could feed the population, supposedly, and feed uh, livestock. Well, uh, livestock didn't like it, they won't eat it. And human uh, Southerners were just too obstinate to try that. And uh, kudzu grew so fast uh, that it just took over everywhere. As a matter of fact, you run along the road and see little bumps and people would say that was a CCC worker that moved too slow. It just covered it right, right over. Uh, so, so a lot of, to answer your question, a, a lot of people in the South experienced that. And Florida was one of the areas where erosion was not necessarily a major problem, except for the upper panhandle area where you have those rolling, rolling hills. Uh, uh, I have a question here. It says, uh, World War II and mosquito control were two events many people considered to be the most significant events in modern Brevard County. Would you agree or disagree and why? I'd have to agree. The Navy, uh, during World War II, they sprayed for mosquitoes. And they were really the ones that started. After the Navy left, the county started a mosquito control program flying small planes. And I think that Lee Winter was one of the, uh, as a county commissioner or whatever, he was one of the leaders in that. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Getting mosquito control started. And Joe Wickham, who just died. Yeah. Yes, Wickham. right. They they spread maybe. the whole county. And you, you, uh, today, I can sit here and I'm sure that most of the people that have been around here as long as I have, or, or since World War II, will agree that there's just no mosquitoes here now. Not now. No. No. I don't care how many we have now, there's just none in comparison. That's right. no. I mean, they, they, you know, you could. As a kid, I can remember doing it. It was fun, and I'd do it today if I could. When the mosquitoes were so thick outside a screen, you'd put your hand on it like that, and you'd let them bite, you know, you'd let them cover your hand. And then, being an army, you'd do this and break the beaks. <laughs> <laughs> you'd see the print of your hand. And you'd see the print of your hand there. Wouldn't Bill Sassery, what was his name? Bill He was a pilot. Sassery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Speedy? The Navy started spraying for them. They didn't tell us all their business. They were just trying to take care of themselves. They were spraying DDT with big planes. Big and, planes. Yeah, and I heard, uh, I've heard older people talk about it, say, you know, we're getting in the end time, said we don't have any mosquitoes like we're supposed to. There's something going wrong. <laughs> they worried about it until they finally discovered that the Navy was spraying with that DDT when the plane had come over your house real low spray and then you knew it was happening. You really had to come in because you could actually feel the the, yeah. pellet, the, the drip it. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of people out there who are not familiar with this. This is a mosquito beater and I'll, before we get to your question, we'll let uh, Speedy explain what you do. Do what? Mervyn Rudin? Oh, he could tell stories about mosquitoes. That, well, he, uh, he, he was saying when he was a kid and out picking oranges and whatever, and mosquitoes so bad, he said, if you want to talk to the picker Speak next, louder, next door, next, next tree over, he said, you throw an orange at him and you speak down through that teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he'd talk about the mosquitoes. I lived across the street from him. And he'd talk about the mosquitoes would come along and he said, you 
you could get some of them by holding up a two before, and then when they hit it, you hammered quick on the other <laughs> side to get there. <laughs> and they fly off of the board if you didn't hold on to it. Let, let me just ask you a question. In 1939, when they started building Banana River Naval Air Station, we'll, and we'll talk about that later on because we've got another group of people that are going to be talking about World War II. What kind, how was that viewed in the com community? All of a sudden you're building the Banana River Naval Air Station and you're bringing these people in from out of town. What was the reaction of the local community? Was there a reaction? It was great. The people could get jobs making 60 cents an hour and they had a, a job to go to. There was always some people that didn't like it. It was going to ruin some. Who? Mrs. Stewart. <laughs> well, it actually, yeah, I guess she was here whenever it happened. And in fact, their water tower was so tall they can't put lights on it so the planes wouldn't hit it and they took their yacht for use in wartime service. They, uh, and Mrs. Stewart, which Stewart was that? Oh, I was in the Bell Oh, I see in the Bell Oh, yeah. W.T. W.T. Um, W.T. Stewart. One of, the, one of the jokes that was going around World War II when all the work started going on, they said the carpenter was at work and somebody came along and said, what are you making? He working. He said, a dollar an hour. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what he was trying to build, but he knew how much he was making. <laughs> Now, I, I've heard that uh, German prisoners of war were, uh, were used out at uh, uh, Banana River Naval Air Station on a limited basis uh, during World War II. Was that an issue of conversation in the community? or? I never heard it. Uh, we have pictures. I, 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 I don't know. I wasn't here. I, I, yeah, you were. I'm older than they are, so yeah. but I, I don't ever recall having heard that we had German prisoners here. Well, well, we yeah. have a couple we of had pictures German, somewhere. We had Germans shooting other folks off there. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, and they they brought, built a swimming pool out there for one of the things. Yeah, there was German prisoners there at the base, and it was talked about that there was German Nazi soldiers right here in this county, but they had them under control out there at the base. <laughs> at, uh, they, were, they were in a lot of locations throughout the United right, States, right, so yeah. we had no monopoly on that. No, but I didn't know whether that was uh, uh, certainly in, in, the, uh, in the height of World War II, uh, particularly the first two, two years, was something that might have signaled some sort of discussion in the community. Uh, uh, the submarine was caused more havoc. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, when, when the submarines were taking the, the merchant ships down, they were bringing the merchant marine survivors into the uh, what was at that time our USO which was right over there where the post yeah. office is now there was a little uh, wooden nice little wooden bungalow type building and uh, I remember at the time that uh, I was part of one of the, the girls are our USO and they called all of us in to help with these people to, to sit and talk to them because they are people who had been through an experience and perhaps they just were probably scared to death. I would have been too. I can remember talking to one man, an, an, uh, an East Indian, and he said this was the third ship from which he'd been torpedoed on. He guess he'd go back for another one. I was talking to one man, a, a survivor that was brought in, and he said that was his, I think it was his eighth trip out of New York, and this is as far as he got. Now that's how bad the submarines were. Yeah. Eight well, trips, and this is as far as he got. Bobby, you worked on the La Paz raising it when it was it was torpedoed and they ran it aground almost at the end of 520 in that about a close area to describe where it came aground and it was salvaged. And one of the commercial fishermen over there, he, uh, my dad saw him one day in town. And he said, "How you doing?" And, he said, Harold, me and the fishman has about worked ourselves to death trying to s save Johnny Walker and his family. It had a cargo <laughs> go of Johnny Walker scotch on that ship, so they had hauled a lot of it in. Nine, <laughs> 900 cases of Bobby and Scott. There was, there was 10,000. Yeah. 10, 10,000 10, cases. 10,000. Now, there wasn't that many when I got out there. <laughs> but, uh, well, let, me ask you, uh, let me ask you a question. In, in 1947, uh, early 48, when they were going to decommission, 
uh, or they did decommission Banana River Naval Air Station. What kind of impact did that have on the community? Had, had the community grown so uh, dependent on those 60 cents an hour jobs? Or, uh, was there a strong reaction to that? Mm -hmm. I think they were up to probably a dollar and a half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the first spring when the shrimp would run and the crabs was run, there was people out there dipping shrimp and crabs that you hadn't seen on that bridge in a long, long time. <laughs> so it did, it did have a... Uh, there was a, a lot of empty housing. Really? Yeah. Uh, Until now, Patrick came yeah. back. Now, I'm going to ask a question that demonstrates my ignorance. Uh, uh, on Palm Way there, where... Uh, John Bennett lives there now. Right. Someone once told me that those were built by the, the Navy. Navy built okay. those. Uh, and was there a training facility here? No, in no, Colorado? that was just housing for, for. Uh, just Navy housing. The married, uh, uh, the, the married uh, personnel or whatever. So they caught a bus and went over the bridge and. Mm -hmm. yeah, they had a the Navy bus. Had a shuttle bus. Yeah, there was another one down there. The same. Yeah, yeah there, was there was a group of housing there. there. Almost opposite where they're building that new Walgreens uh -huh. store, just on the west side of US 1, just south of that. And they were selling those off in uh, 47, because that's mm -hmm. when I got married in 47, and they were selling those off. And the little two bedroom houses were selling for $3,500. Wow. And we couldn't get up $350. Hindsight tells you you could have if you'd have really done it. But, <laughs> You know, you got pride, and you're not going to go ask this one for it or that one for it or whatever. And so we we didn't we didn't buy down there. A lot of folks did, um, but that's that's when they were sent. To, it was it was uh, it was hard. Uh, I know Ralph was having a hard time with getting a job about that time. He worked for the telephone company when we got married, and then they decided to strike that summer. And that's hard on uh, newlyweds, sure. especially when they get married with nothing in their pockets and uh it, it was tough he finally did go to work uh over there in um i guess it must have been 51. finally got a job over there in 51. by then it was i big. never could get a job at the base now i don't know why i was not stupid i went to washington work i went to key western work i got a job anywhere i want i could not get a job at patrick of uh, what was banana river <laughs> Larry, you had a question. I just want to interject, if I may. You were talking about the economy during the Second World War when they built in Savannah. My mother and dad had a department store. And I remember business picked up big time for them. A lot of the black workers come in the store and to cash a check, and, you know, and, and to buy something. But uh, another comment I wanted to might be too Georgia practice we have here. <laughs> when, when we Make that three. <laughs> <laughs> when we moved here, it was 48 states. And they always told my dad, said, there's only 47 states now. Mm -hmm. said, Georgia went to Florida. Florida, Florida went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that earlier. <laughs> But I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> let me uh, let me throw a couple three names at you and just sort of get your reaction uh, and and sort of respond to these people. Fortenberry. A hey, Fortenberry had sawmill over on Merritt Island. He was a county commissioner for a long, long period of time. In fact, to get him out of there, they were went to Tallahassee and changed it to where you voted countywide on your county commissioners. Was he couldn't, they couldn't beat him in his own district. And that got him out, and then a few years ago they changed it back before you vote on your own district now. But Mr. Fortenberry was a county commissioner over there for years, and he had the sawmill, and he bought property and bought property. And I've heard that one of the remarks he made that he had never sold a car or a piece of land that he owned, and he was getting too old to start it. But being a county commissioner, there was scrap iron drives, World War II, they wanted all the iron and metal that they could get, so he had to sell a lot of his old junk cars <laughs> to maintain his standards with the county commissioner. The voters would still elect him. He had a son, Gordon, who, was a, who had aspirations to be a professional boxer. But there was always told to me that he had glass hands, and so he didn't go. Not too a glass very hand, far, but glass, glass hands. hands that they were, he just 
uh, couldn't couldn't do it. And he was, as I recall, the best looking of the Fortenberry sons. Bobby, do you have any uh, any comments on Fortenberry? I, I I can remember Gordon Fortenberry and. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he had glass hands so much. I do remember he had for his size and Bill, he did have very small hands. Hmm. Now, I don't recall whether he broke those hands while boxing or what, but it should be a glass hand. Sure. But he went quite high as a, a light heavyweight. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he was ranked, I think, the second in the world at one time. Wow. But uh, he went a long way. But he... Uh, well, this kind of got too old, I guess, or whatever, <laughs> and he was out of it. Well, this uh, this area, Coco in particular, has always had a reputation for being very athletically oriented. Uh, baseball uh, certainly comes to mind, and talking with Speedy and some of the old old timers, people like uh, uh, Eddie Harrell and even Sonny Butts playing, and a whole host of people like that. Uh, do you think there's any? particular reason why this emphasis was placed on sports in this part of the county as opposed to say other parts of the county. Gonna beat Titusville whatever it took <laughs> in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, after World War II there they started up local town teams and uh, I guess it was not league rules it was very binding or whatever and it summertime ball season it would be rainy and Provo Park was where the ball games were played and the park could get wet and they'd have a game schedule maybe Wednesday afternoon because the whole town closed on Wednesday afternoon so you could go to the ballpark. The post office closed on Wednesday afternoon. The bank closed. The, the town closed where you could go to the ball game. But the field would be wet and they would pour gasoline on the field and burn it and break it while it was burning to dry that water up. And I've seen them probably put three or 400 gallons of gasoline on there, not all at once, but different times in rake it, trying to get it dried up. And somebody would say, well, I go, guess we're going to make it this time. And somebody else there in the group would say, we got to. Said, I've got too much money bet on this game, and we can't get that picture from Rollins if we don't play today or whatever. <laughs> So. All those small towns were saying. I know I had a cousin in Claremont. Uh huh. And boy, they were betting and importing players, ringers. Mm -hmm. They'd yeah. bring in ringers. Yeah. And then they'd spot one to other people and they complain about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Speedy was talking about burning the gasoline on the fields. They were, they were not burning the grass, they were burning the clay. Uh -huh. Yeah, the clay infield. On the infield. And uh, R.O. Nichols was the a man that owned the uh, pure oil distributorship and he'd bring his pure oil truck out there and pour that gasoline on there i understand he paid for all the gas he loved baseball he wants that baseball game played so bad that he would furnish the gas to put on there well did they play just during the daytime or were the lights on the field uh, they, they had, it was lighted it was Later. lighted before Later. it was lighted before world war uh, right Later. before world war what? 1939 and 40. 49. Were they members of what, the, the Sally yeah. League or? Class D. Florida, Florida State, State League. Florida State League. Yeah. We had Class D, Florida State League. The Florida League East and, Coast and, League. And Florida Miami, Florida. Fort Lauderdale, uh, 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 West Palm Beach, Coco. Well, my husband played with, with the Class D League, the Florida uh, Coco Class D League. Uh, Goose Kettles was the manager then. And... <laughs> Did Ralph come here with the base, or did he no, come here Ralph, playing ball? No, he came here with the telephone company. Oh, okay. Uh, well, our first remembrance of him was he playing ball. Well, he yeah. came in, in uh, August of 46, and I met him in October, and we got married in January. Yeah. And uh, he played ball. That The first ball he played with Coco was uh, in 47. Now, this picture around the corner there says 48, but that's 46. Those kids, kids, <laughs> those guys were... <laughs> Um, the team in 46 and then most of them were the same ones that he played with uh, in 47 and they went on and uh, uh, got real serious about their ball. There was some real serious ball playing going on. My first son was born in the seventh game of the Shawnee's playoff with Titusville which I didn't get to see on account of that. But <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that 
even before that time of ball, there was ball here way back. I can remember going, well, before then, my grandmother talked about going to the ball games and the uh, ballpark was up where uh, Scotty's is now. And there had been a hill up there and on the hill is where they built the grandstand and then the ball looked down to the, you know, to this way. Yeah. yeah. This, this was left field and that way. And uh, before that, but she said before the grandstand was built, they would park, uh, be on the street and watch the ball games, park on the side, you know, on the street and watch the ball games. And this was way back in the early 20s. Mm -hmm. And then it, it just came on from there. I think my daddy played back in those days. I know a lot of Titusville guys played by the Norwoods. Uh, Willie Norwood's brother Red played for Titusville back when I was uh, about 14. Was there a yeah. professional? Uh, but I don't know if that was professional then. The professional came that I know of in 47 or 8 when Ralph went with, when we went with Florida State League. And they were, what major league team were they affiliated with? Nick, I just ran across the book of my house that I want to bring over. Yeah. It's the uh, 1940 semi professional league uh, playoff game book, but it's showing all the teams that were top notch there, but we were a semi professional game. And Coco was on top that year. Mm -hmm. My father was playing on that team, I remember, and I'm an early joiner, and uh, Eddie Harrell, I'm not sure who else was on there, but I just. Buddy Hopkins? The reason I'm asking is I, I was reading the other day. And I, I can't remember exactly what I was reading, but it was uh, was talking about one of the uh, major league uh, uh, players, a black player who had played in Coco. Philippe Lou. Philippe Lou. And it was that was that in this league, or was there a major league association with that? This was later. It was Class B. This was later. Class D. Yeah. And they had two or three players that went on the major league. Yeah, my daddy was scorekeeping at that time, mm -hmm. I remember. Was the turnout and the support oh. as great as it had been? Yes, Those fans were always good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now that the, the Marlins are here with their, with their uh, 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 do you find that there's probably a drop off? Is it just symptomatic of the time you were out there the know. other day? I go, I go to see the Marlins spring training games, but I don't know about the MMT games. Yeah. That was a big deal. There wasn't anything else to do in this town. Then, except for Stevens. Yeah, there was because no television. Was it was. Uh, I personally love the semi. It was, it yeah, was that's. Spirit yeah, that's when. Uh, when Our Ralph. town better than your town. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that is that uh, would you is that symptomatic of or the cause of the division between North Central and South? No, that's been North. forever. <laughs> no. <it's, laughs> uh, <laughs> Charlie's father, I remember him playing, he played, he played semi-pro, yeah. and uh, he was always, he supported the baseball, but uh, the first professional baseball in Coco was in the old Florida East Coast League, which I mentioned was Miami, Miami Beach, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, and up to here, and they were called the Coco Flyers, going back to the naval base, that's where the name Flyers came from. They had, they had just started up on it and it was just before World War II. Mm. So it was before 1941. Wow. Well, we also at that time had the Indianapolis Indians uh, spring training here. I, uh, Gabby Hartnett was here because I brought, I brought in a picture that we had. I was working for Julian Langner, who was the president of the Chamber of Commerce at that time, or secretary of the Chamber of Commerce. And he had Doris Bishop and me come out there in bathing suits and our bags of oranges and go out to the ballpark, out to Provo Park, and have some pictures taken with Gabby Hartman. Uh, What's the J.L. Smith's wife? Huh? J.L. Smith's wife, Kim and Daddy Hartman. I don't know. I no, it, I don't think it's him. It's 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 uh, somebody else. But it's a, a, a ball player. But I don't. I never could remember the name. Ralph would tell me and. It, can go. Just as we've got a lot of people that came to work, a lot of citizens that came to work at uh, the Space Center or something and stayed, we had lots of citizens that came here to play ball. The early Joiner and his brother Hollis, they were 
brought in to play ball, and Jimmy Dunn, that was later sheriff of the county, he was brought in to play ball. How about Lake and, Selsby? Did, was uh, he? Uh, he he was play? from up New Smyrna. They brought him here and got him a job as a deputy, mm -hmm. and Eddie Harrell was brought here to play ball. He, they got him a job at Nevin's Fruit Company, and he worked there right on. Uh, Jim Caldwell came here to play ball. I don't know. Johnny Colbert. There's just any number of people that came here to play ball, and they they liked it and stayed. This town loved their baseball. They really did. I worked for, for Mr. Travis uh, before 68, and I can remember him telling me years ago that when uh, Lawrence Abney, when we were playing ball, Coco and Titusville or whatever, he said, Lawrence Abney, was an outfielder. And he said, there's one thing about Lawrence, Lawrence always came up with the ball. Now there might have been a new ball hit out there, but Lawrence <laughs> might not have brought in a new ball when it came, but he always came up with the ball. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you a story about baseball that, that, that your daddy told me. That back when he played. Yeah, definitely. And if, if people can remember where the railroad is now, of course at that time, the railroad came down through here. But the baseball field, if you go out Peachtree Street across the hill where the cemetery is, and back down where the railroad is now, there was a real low place, and the, and the baseball field was the other side of where the railroad is. And he said they had some long timbers that they'd walk across over there to get to the ball field out Peachtree Street because that was the best way to get to it. And that's the way the people went out. They'd walk out there to watch the ball game. And later they built the ballpark up. Up there. Uh, yeah, uh, up where you're talking about. But I don't know that very many people realize there was ever a ball field out there. That's what your dad said. Uh, 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 yeah. Well, the, as far as the, knowing what the, the, the property being moved uh, and bought and sold, you've got to realize that unless we've learned it in history coming down, we were just high school kids at that time. And uh, I'm, as I said, I, I got out of high school in 39, and they were uh, several years back behind me. And... Uh, I, as a girl, could have cared less whether anybody bought any property or not. You know, I, I was interested in dating at that time, if I could, you know. I think there was a lot of hesitation because they closed up the base, you know, and they thought something like that would happen again. You mean with the Space Center, that they thought it was just a flash in the pan kind, kind, of, uh, kind of operation? Well, uh, I was throwing some names at you. Let me throw another one now. Uh, uh, a couple of them we've already talked about. Uh, 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 one we talked about uh, several weeks ago here, Gus Edwards. Uh, 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 I, 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 I'm very much interested in Mr. Edwards, and I sort of get uh, uh, two opinions. One was that uh, we, we have the image of him uh, being the father of Cocoa Beach, but we also, there's apparently another image that he was uh, somewhat of a shrewd dealer uh, to, to sometimes that you needed uh, somebody to describe it to when you shook hands. Occasionally you would have to count your fingers just to, to make sure they were there. Uh, do you have any reaction to him? Was he, was he considered a, uh, how was he perceived out in this community? They're, they're thinking carefully. <laughs> it is being recorded. Well, Gus Lowe owned a, a tremendous amount of property. He had been an attorney in town, and he had bought up property, and he promoted sales of property. He had a zoo in Cocoa that was up uh, on Highland Street. is the best area I can determine, uh, west of Forest Avenue, between there and the present US-1 along Highland Street. He had a zoo, and he, to bring 
people in to see the zoo and maybe they'd get a pitch, sell them some land or something. And supposedly he had uh, armadillos in that zoo and he sold, I saw ads in the old Coco Tribune that he had uh, zoo animals for sale. And I suppose he sold whatever he could, and, but anyway, the, the armadillers couldn't sell armadillos, so they just turned them loose, and supposedly that's why we have armadillos in this area today. But having property and having money, even though they're hand in hand, they're two different things. If you don't have sale for that property, you don't have money. So he was in the situation of being land poor there for several years until actually after World War II and this space center started up. And uh, in uh, World War II, there was price controls and rationing and all that there was not any big growth in things that took off like it did at the space center where somebody, a promoter could come in and buy land and build houses and sell them and all. But when that started, Gus Edwards came, he sold property and had money. So he went through a, a tough period of time, but he always believed in Cocoa Beach. And there was a painting in his office that he had made uh, depicting what he thought the area would look like someday. And it's uh, surprisingly, I'm not sure where that painting is anymore, but it's surprising how accurate it was before everything went on. If you look at today's situation, an aerial shot of today against his photograph or his painting, it's very close. I know one deal that he made as well, the Boy Scout. The Boy Scout, you got my memory, they had a campsite out there in Cocoa Beach. And then Gus had a little piece of land here. So uh, during that swap, uh, they swapped with him, I guess maybe for a snug harbor was built out there, I'm not sure. But the Boy Scout had a, had a little land out there. And he had to clear title of them scouts in Cocoa. I, I came here in 53 and 54, I became scoutmaster of that group. And we met at the little scout hut, our little fire tower, and the little scout hut, and the band practiced there. No. And uh, later on, Tiger the highway beam. went through, that piece of property became valuable, they gave us $4,000. So they had to set up a group of guys here, Judge Acreage and Carl Wilder and some others. I was a scout leader, but uh, they didn't put me on that board. But they took possession of that land from Gus Edwards, made it official, Clear title so forth. They got four thousand dollars for their part of the four lane, four lane US one. Anyway, Gus said we did us a good job. We still own that Philly station there. It's scout friend of scout and I helped set up that group. And we now get about six hundred dollars a month from the people who run that Philly station. That money goes into a fund and we manage ten scouts to camp from our camp in Grammarie, buy supplies. But Gus said we did us a good job by giving us a clear title of that piece of land. Maybe rather than that piece of Cocoa Beach. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, sir. I remember it was Christmas Day, 1943. And now I remember it's Christmas Day. It's my dad's birthday. And we had relatives, so I wanted to stay coming there and we were celebrating his birthday. And he came. Speak up a little bit. Larry. He came to the house banging on the door. I guess he saw so many cars there. He was uh, feeling no pain. And he was trying to sell lots of it to Snug Harbor. And uh, that's just, you know, when you say you're a miracle. You know, well, the, he's, uh, like I say, I'm just very interested in people who were active during the boom period and what happened to them. And so many of the people who were active in the boom period uh, died soon afterwards or left. The, and, but he was one of those survivors. and. And uh, it's rather interesting, you get uh, so many different pictures of Gus uh, as a man who was very charitable and who did good deeds like that, but who... Uh, he had a daughter named Patty. Uh, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I've heard stories about when he put together Snug Harbor, uh, he kept uh, part of the coastline property in his name, so you had water access, but... Ten feet out, it belonged to him, and you had to deal with him first. I don't know whether that's, you know, good business or what. But he was uh, true. Uh, how about Marie Holderman? Any comments on uh, uh, her as uh, 
it relates to cocoa or you know, growing up or nothing personal particularly just to know that she uh, she was a woman who came uh, and by the fact that her husband had a stroke uh, she was forced into having to take over and uh, fortunately had the capabilities to do this and worked long and hard and uh, I guess gathered around herself some real good people to work with the papers and uh, had very high morals about what would and would not go in the paper. Uh, killings might not make it. <laughs> Just, might, be, might have happened, but it might not make the paper, you know. Uh, they passed away. No. <laughs> Bobby, you have any comments about uh, Mrs. Holman? Well, Mrs. Holman, as I remember her when, as a little boy, she, she, when she came here, she was uh, white-headed then. And uh, I know that, that she worked hard at the newspaper. Now, I, I, would, I would say if you want to talk, find out about uh, Marie Holderman, <coughs> Bo, when he was growing up, he lived next door to him for quite a while. So he might could tell you some stories about him that I don't know. So. Well, 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 certainly. Uh, uh, well, I'm probably talking a little later. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> certainly uh, an important person in the city of Cocoa. Right. Uh, two more. Uh, Mert Tharp. Who? Who? Mert. Mert Berger. <laughs> yeah, Mert Tharp. Mert Tharp, yeah. Uh, she was, uh, the reason I bring her up, she was described to me as the mother of Cocoa politics. Uh, and I thought, what a thing to be labeled. Uh, <laughs> this is like saying. Uh, I don't know, but she did. She she ran a restaurant. She was a hardworking woman, mm -hmm. and uh, she she sure did. She, was she, she supported her family or? and her husband. I don't know if he ever worked a day in life, but she she did work hard. She was a hard worker. Did, wasn't right. she a city councilwoman? Didn't she run for council? I, and she was I, a city councilwoman. She, she cared. She that, cared about what yeah. went on in her town, and, and did, she knew what was going she, on, and. And Coco because of people coming to her restaurant. Right. And I think a couple of the, the city fathers, a story I've heard, now this might not be true, there's a joke, they talked her and run for city council, and she won and she was a good one. So the joke kind of came back on them. I don't know yeah. where that story is true. Well, enough. I understand, uh, like I say, she was described to me as a, as a yeah. lady who was very much cared about Coco and very much involved. Charlie? I was just going to say back, I guess, in the 60s when she first ran, everybody used to Gathered out of her for coffee in the morning. Jack Oakley promoted her running for city council. He got everybody to put the money up. He went out and collected the money to put up for her to run for her fee. And she really didn't want to. But after a while, it starts out like a good idea. I guess three go got to her. She turned out to be one heck of a good council person and mayor. And she really got a lot done when we started this Coco Village thing. She, she was our big pusher in the city hall to get things going, which was really nice and we were getting a lot of. I, this has been going on about an hour and a half. Let me just ask one last question and then we'll, uh, we'll just uh, sort of break up and you can informally do it. If you had to make a list of three people from your memories of COCA that uh, were most influential either in creating what Coco is all about or Central Brevard because I don't want to leave out Merritt Island uh, or Coco Beach. Uh, who would those three people be in just in 10 or 12 words, why? Speedy, see there, Bobby, I started the back of the alphabet. <laughs> I didn't look at you either. <laughs> I'd put A. Fortenberry on the list, maybe not at the top of the list, but he would be on the list. He was county commissioner of Merritt Island for many, many years, and he worked to promote the area. He was the man that pushed to have Canaveral Harbor built, one of the great pushes to do that. I'd also put on that list C. Sweetsmith. He was, uh, I don't know what all he was, was the county commissioner, but he, he knew how to get things done. And he made many trips to Tallahassee and Washington's and different places to to help get uh, Coco going. And Charlie Daddy Brees was on there as well. He'd be on the list. If I had to stop at three, that's 
what I'd put in because Brees knew how to get things done. Uh, if well, I was think fine. about it a week, I might make a different <laughs> list, but at this time, that's they certainly deserve on people that made Coco what it was. Marie Holderman would belong on there, mm -hmm. so I'll shut up at that. Marion? Well, I think about Lee Winter. Uh, you talked about uh, Sweet Smith being a county commissioner. Lee Winter also was a county commissioner, and uh, the only one I know of for sure that never made a nickel off of prior knowledge. And I guess prior knowledge is the fact that you can buy properties or you could do things uh, if you wanted to. It was sort of frowned on, I suppose, but Lee never did. Uh, and Lee was one of those who did know how to get things done. He knew how to work with all the other county commissioners in the county. And uh, they, they did things and got things done that would not have been done, roads built and uh, all sorts of things. And Lee was, he was the best, to my knowledge, the best county commissioner we ever had. He had the poorest uh, personal life management of most folks, but he, <laughs> That's Mar an inside joke. Mar married several times, and uh, however the last one he got was a good one, and uh, she stayed with him till his time came. But, uh, and then I also think about uh, uh, Dave Nisbet, how hard Dave worked, particularly around the, the time of uh, the base coming in, Banana River coming in, and how he worked with all those folks. Uh, uh, Fred Travis running Travis Hardware for his father uh, after his father died. He was the oldest, I guess, of the Travis sons. Um, there were several of them. There was Bob and Doc and Gator. Gator was the fun type boy. And uh, Par Par Mr. Travis, Fred Travis, his nickname was Parse. Now, I don't know who gave it to him, but I guess it's because he was, I don't know whether it was because he's parsimonious or whether he was just uh, like a parson. But uh, he used to tell me, we were talking about my number three child and how fun loving he was and whatever, and Mr. Travis Parse said, well, he said every family's got to have one. Gator was theirs. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, uh, he did a great deal of um, work uh, in the, the community giving uh, anonymously. People did not know what he had done. Uh, so he and he never lot. he never allowed it to be bad, but he did a good bit, gave a good bit. Bobby, well, you know, I have to agree with them that, that, that there's so many. Mm -hmm. uh, you stop right now and think about who is running the city of Coco today. They won't be running it five or six years from now. So through the years, there has been so many. And I can throw some names out there, like them or don't like them, that they haven't mentioned. John Dalbora was very influential in, in uh, bringing this, this whole area up. W.H. Falk mm -hmm. was. Yeah. And uh, we could go on and on. All these people were good. And, and uh, of course, you know, Dalbora was in the, the uh, fruit business, the packing house business. And W.H. Falk had uh, many holdings, one being he was a a, a car dealership and road whatever. Road builder. And also a road builder. He built the first paved road on Merritt Island. So you can go on and on with these and, and uh, we could probably kick this around for an hour and a half, naming sure. names of people that really helped this community. Yeah. Well, I, I said we we're going to quit. I, just because we do have a couple of people who haven't been here before and who are very much interested in this area, I'm going to sort of end this officially on, on uh, uh, sort of a, the humorous side. Uh, what's the significance of number nine? <laughs> well, I got my for <laughs> You'll have to ask the girls about that. Now, for those of you that don't know, number nine uh, was a place on the river uh, that was somewhat of a uh, well-known parking space. And, uh, it had limited access and limited egress. One car. And, and one you car. Could, get two. You could get, get two. two. 
you got there and you claimed it, well, and you, you held it for as long as you could. Uh, so, uh, I, I do invite you to, to come up and talk to these guys, but before they, uh, uh, they leave, I'd like to give them a, a, a certificate of appreciation. Marion, thank you so much for, mm -hmm. for participating in this, and, and Bobby, thank you. And uh, thank you. Dr. Harold, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Speedy recently received from Indian River University a uh, doctorate in folk life studies. Uh, and he'll be happy to show you his diploma uh, 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 when this is all over. Thank you very much. There's uh, uh, punch and cookies will be available in just a few minutes. So come on up and visit. And, Thank you very much. Clyde uh, uh, mentioned uh, the fact, Speedy, that you didn't give an explanation of this to those people who are new to the area. So, if, if you lived in this area back when we was talking about all the things that happening and not much going on prior to all the Banana River DDT spraying and that type of things, the mosquitoes was thicker than you've ever seen love bugs, or they was just unbelievably thick. And at each door outside hung one of these uh, fronds out of the palm when it first grew up before it opened, you'd cut them and dry them and that was, they hung outside your door and when you came home you beat the mosquitoes away from your door so they wouldn't go in with you. So uh, 15 years ago, we decided that the area had grown so much that the ones of us were still here, we didn't see and talk to one another, that we needed one day a good, year no. to get together and just talk with one another. We, we, we had no program plan, there's no, uh, no anything except we just have a place to get together and you sign in and get a name tag. And we have, when we was talking about getting the organization started, the name Mosquito Beater was suggested from the tool and from the people that done it, that used them. And during that 15 years, we've been able to put out a book each year that we get people to write us stories, whatever they will think of and write. And they, they go back all the way to the beginning, we have about the last three years that are available. The very first one was not much of a book, but it was a book of a kind where that people could write another was a friend of theirs address on the back of it or something and take it on. So from that beginning, it has grown and we had approximately a thousand people at our sign up last well, the first of March. We start the second Friday in March. I believe Mar Nick said, said it'd be the second March. second March of each year. So don't wait on the second March. Just the second Friday of each March we start up. So it's uh, an unusual organization that we do record some of this for history. We get in 15 years. We've never had a thing go wrong because there's nothing planned. Speedy, Speedy, how many the first time? How many, how many registered that first year? Do we know? I don't have a figure, but there was probably 500 people or more that the first year. Even the first year? The first year. Speedy, you mentioned that right now we don't have a program at all, but, but uh, we tried having that in about the uh, number two and three uh, so many people. We had a band, about a uh, uh, eight or ten piece yeah. band to play if the people wanted to dance or whatever. They just wanted to talk. You couldn't even hear the band, and with that many pieces playing, honestly, you could. So we're just sitting that. Well, another <laughs> thing. Now he's got this, and you see, this is real dry. They weren't this stiff because this one's never been really it hadn't used. Been used. <laughs> but they became as soft as the material that I've got on now. It it. Why they didn't break, I never knew. You soaked them would... in human blood when you beat out of those mosquitoes. <laughs> I never had a red one. <laughs> but they would be so soft and, and even shredded finer than this. Yeah. Now, I remember when my grandfather would make them maybe even shredded finer than this. And then I told you he had a rooming house there. And this was outside the door of the rooming house. Did he have a smudge pot? 
Yeah. No, we didn't have smudge pots at our Yeah. My dad absolutely Yeah. The, the big old barrel that's in front of Gould's store down there, you, he used to have two of them in his store. One of them had a false bottom in it that had coat pins in it, and the other one was full of, of smudge powder. It was a, a deal made out of sawdust and a, a low grade, but it burned it as that smudge powder. All he wanted was smoke. Yeah. I want to show you, demonstrate if I can, how I saw a lady use it while he was walking out to get her paper. In her days, the space program went up toward the harbor on the 818-2 lane road and, and, and coming out from the, from the uh, river, Banana Riverside, this old lady coming up from her homestead back there to get the paper or something. She was doing what we call a syncopated walk. You probably could demonstrate that. <laughs> she was swatting those things and walking on like this and just doing it and we're like this. <laughs> All the way up the back to get her paper. I thought it was syncopated walk. Well, you know. If you did it right, you flip it far enough back, and it came on your butt side. You know, it, it got to your butt side back there. And, uh, you know, the arm up and down and around, you, you just, and as I said, they were much more limber than this. Oh, yeah. My grandmother had two of them. Oh. Outside, that tends to be wrong for the back. Yeah. And you just wanted to knock them off when you went into the screen door. Yeah, yeah. You 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 had as many as you had could get anybody to make for you or make yourself. We carried some ice spots to the baseball fields when my dad played baseball. Yeah. It was a good place to grow up in. And when I get through growing, I'll let you know about that part.